Welcome to the Faith Trends Podcast, conversations that connect research with ministry. My name is Lindsay Calloway, and I'm a researcher with the Center for Research on Church and Faith, a research branch of the Evangelical Fellowship of Canada. On this episode, Rick Heemstra and I speak with James Watson about Canadian pastors and multivocational ministry. James is core health and planting consultant with the Salvation Army. Along with a team of church researchers, James released the Canadian Multivocational Ministry Project Report in 2020, which served as the groundwork for many other publications, most recently the book Tentmakers, Multivocational Ministry in Western Society. We speak with James about what tent making is and some of the assumptions behind it. We talk about how pastors understand their calling while holding multiple forms of employment and what it means for denominations, seminaries, and churches to support pastors in these roles. Rick and I take a moment to reflect on our conversation with James at the end of the episode, so be sure to stick around. For several years, James, you've been studying pastors and multivocational ministry, which is just one of the many terms used to describe a a congregational minister or missionary who also has other paid employment. Could you tell us a bit about multivocational ministry and why it's an important issue to research? Well, for a number of us who are involved in the research project, it's part of our own personal ministry journey. So when my wife and I moved to Kitchener to be part of a church plant, we were not paid. We volunteered in ministry, as did most of the congregation. Those who were paid were only paid part-time. And so it sort of was the ethos of that new church, that everyone was committed to mission and involved in whatever was going on in ministry, as well as our other paid employment. I was actually tri-vocational for a few years where I had two half-time jobs and then was also volunteering with the church. So part of it, part of it is that, Rick, is that sort of uh, a number of us who were involved in this research have that as part of our own background. Part of it, I would say, is sort of the biblical story where, you know, we encounter Jesus, the son of a carpenter. <laughs> And there's all these allusions to what is going on in life within the Gospels. Part of it is, you know, when we pick up with Paul in the book of Acts, and there's indicators that he was, uh, you know, we use the term tent maker. It might have been more in the lines of a a leather worker who, uh, you know, worked on things like awnings. And we sometimes skip over how important the marketplace was for Paul in terms of being able to engage with people who were just in their natural environment. We sometimes hear references to the Agora, to to the marketplace as a place where we can actually have some genuine relationships with people, understand what their life is like, and be able to engage in those deeper issues of life like faith. But some of those stories, I think, were partially inspirational. And then the third major factor that I think drew together the collaboration was a number of leaders recognizing that Canada may be at a point in time where there's high value for having one foot in the church and one foot in other vocational work. So both in terms of financial sustainability, which is one of the assumptions a lot of people make when they start talking about multivocational ministry or tent making or bivocational ministry or co-vocational ministry. But the other element is sort of how these things fit together. So there's opportunities that are provided by not just working for a congregation, being paid by a church, but also having employment or substantial volunteer opportunities within the broader community. James, you know, I was as I was thinking about this podcast and preparing for it, I actually remembered that growing up, my bus driver was the pastor of the church down the road from where my house was. And I just assumed that this was a form of supplementary income for him because he pastored a small rural church. That isn't until I read your research. And you and your colleagues address the assumption that tent making is just for the money. Could you explain what other reasons pastors gave for pursuing a tent making approach to ministry? We intentionally asked people who were involved in both congregational leadership and some other form of work who covered sort of a broad spectrum of experience. 
So different kinds of jobs, different kinds of churches, different regions across Canada, and also at different stages with it. Some were very new into this experience, and some were, it was over 10 years that they'd been combining congregational work with other work. And we asked some very open-ended questions because we knew we didn't necessarily have all the right questions to ask them. So wanted to leave some room for them to inform us as to what direction we should take. And one of the patterns that emerged was this relationship between what they discerned as their congregational mission and how they understood their other work. We had a few people who were a bit conflicted. They felt like, you know, this isn't working anymore. It's not working the way it used to, or this is temporary because at some point, one of these two is going to shift more. And that came on both sides. The, the church planter who felt like one of their two other jobs was going to be displaced as their congregation grew and they needed to commit more time to the congregation. And also the individual who felt like their career in marketing was going to continue, but their role as a congregational leader may be short term or they may be turning over responsibilities, developing leaders uh, who would take on responsibility for that part. So there's some who were in sort of a conflicted space around identifying, okay, these aren't fitting together the way that they had or the way that we'd hoped. There were also those who did recognize that money played a part in being able to have other work. It gave them some freedom, both in terms of having financial sustainability for themselves or for their family, but also in not having sort of a dependent relationship with the congregation, where there was an expectation that the congregation provided for all their needs. And so that provided a certain kind of uh, healthy independence or, or partial interdependence. And so we called that lucrative, right? There is a financial reason for them to have the other work. The one that I had not anticipated, I called complementary. And when we discussed this with our team, uh, there was some interest or recognition that this was taking place in certain interviews that we had. For example, the individual who worked part-time for a family business, and it meant that they got to spend time with one of their relatives who they really wanted to maintain relationship with. Right? Their primary passion was in pastoral ministry, but they recognized this other work gave them an opportunity to renew another part of their life that they really wanted to be able to invest in. There is also an individual who mentioned, you know, yes, there is some economic benefit to working at fixing lab equipment in sort of a specialized shop, but also identified that pastoral ministry can be sort of open-ended. <laughs> when we're working with people, there isn't necessarily an endpoint where we say, oh, everything's fixed now. But with working on lab equipment, he could get a piece, you know, finely, finely machined and operating to the specifications. And he could say, okay, that, that's done. I've accomplished that. So sort of a sense of emotional satisfaction coming from the other work that uh, fit a need for the individual. For a number of people, we found the uh, integrated perspective. Some people are using the term co-vocational, where the two types of work or more than two types of work actually have sort of a common investment into the mission of the congregation. That was varied in terms of how people described why their other work works so well with congregational ministry. For example, we had one farmer in our selection of interviewees who said that a lot of their devotional reflection, their preparation for the sermon, uh, their preparation for Bible study or for discipling actually came on the seat of their tractor, that they found the agricultural work, the rhythms of agricultural work, very reassuring. Um, said that, you know, everyone in their rural community understood that, you know, there was a pastoral role that was played and a farmer's role that played and that certain times of year that the farmer's role won out. <laughs> During lambing season, people weren't expecting pastoral visits. Another individual who was highly motivated, entrepreneurial, said they had been doing this combined work for over 20 years in two different countries. Um, running an IT consulting business with a half dozen employees, and also uh, leading a church that was fairly recently started, still sort of considered it to be a church plant, 
and also running some winter sheltering out of the uh, church building and said, you know, this works great for me. Like in our family, we consider all of life to be on mission. And so this is just how we reflect that. And said that in their particular city, it could be awkward to introduce yourself as a pastor. There could be some immediate suspicions about, you know, what your agenda is with the person, some confusion about what it means to be a pastor. And said that often it was through having relationships with colleagues or coworkers or clients and being able to sit down and talk with each other that created sort of the environment of trust where you could start sharing, well, this is what is really important to me, right? Caring for the people in the neighborhood, being part of what it means to be a community of faith. But it took, it took some time to sort of build that, the bridges of trust necessary in order to get to that deeper level of personal conversation. And so the other work provided some of those opportunities to have contacts and meaningful relationships that would have been more difficult if their sole role was as pastor. James, you rightly point out that we can find examples of tent making in the Bible, so this isn't a new thing. But I think that in terms of the conversation that we're having now, it's fairly recent, probably in the last 20, 10, 20 years that we've been having it. And when I listen to you talk, I hear a lot of missional language, being on mission and the word missional. How do you think the missional church movement prepared us to have this discussion now? Is there any relationship or am I, am I seeing something that isn't there? I think you're on to something, but I think you might have glossed over a historical piece as well. So, for example, when I was in discussion with someone who is part of a, a mission agency, mission movement coming out of the Plymouth Brethren tradition, when I was discussing what we were finding and who we were talking to and what they were doing, that leader said, oh, yeah, that's what we always did. <laughs> we never had paid pastors in our tradition. Everyone worked and everyone volunteered with what it took to shape congregational life and to, and to be the congregation together. A few other traditions that's maybe not as explicit. I work uh, for the Salvation Army. And often if I lead with the comment, oh, I'm doing some work on research on bivocational ministry, they say, oh yeah, we, we don't do that. Then I say, but we have people who are pastors and thrift store managers and also run the local food bank, <laughs> right? And so there's a multi-role uh, ministry taking, taking place. And so I, I think we've had a lot of those things going on in certain circles within the Canadian church environment that isn't always recognized as such. It's not given its own category. It's just, this is what we needed to do, right? This was practical, pragmatic, or in some cases, it was part of their inherent theology of understanding work and mission. But I do agree with you that I think the missional focus of the past few decades and the idea of how is it that we are fully integrated with the community and that there's an opportunity to holistically give expression to what it means to be a follower of Jesus has certainly fueled conversation. And for some of the people in our interviews, it was obvious that that was, uh, that was a big motivation for them to be involved. We talked to uh, one individual who actually works for a, a Christian mission in a large Canadian urban center, but who said, in order for us to have meaningful connections with urban inhabitants, <laughs> We need to be able to live in the apartment building. We need to be able to live in this space and not have high expectations that the people that we're sharing the gospel with, that we're sharing life with, are necessarily going to pay the bill for our own livelihood. Right? Those aren't the exact words they use, but that was sort of the, the overall intent of what this individual was saying. And so having the work that was done as an administrator funded the lifestyle of being able to live in that part of the city and be able to have meaningful relationships with neighbors and open up their apartment to the neighbors around them. So I'm thinking of the denominational leaders who may be listening to this conversation, and I would think that they're hearing a couple of different things. One, there's someone who uh, intentionally sets out to be bivocational, by conviction, as a form of mission, 
And then there's the other church that perhaps is in decline and is forced into that position. And one is sort of easier to welcome, I, I suppose, than the other. How would you talk to denominational leaders to help them think about that second situation? It's a great question. There were some examples of people connecting with congregations that were facing some kind of internal crisis, either you know a decline in membership or there was a financial situation that had been brewing for a while or that had suddenly come into awareness and they're trying to think about how can we do ministry differently that is sustainable. So I think that's the second category that you're talking about, right? Is a, a congregation that um, there's questions about financial sustainability. And one of the observations I would make of a couple of the interviewees who spoke to that situation specifically was the value of a high degree of intentionality. And so one of the areas where it was really helpful from the perspective of the interviewee, right? So the person who's taking on a pastoral role was the intentional conversation about how this could work well. Uh, the one example was a couple uh, who were serving in pastoral ministry, but their their pathway to getting there was having a couple of rounds of conversation with the same church. So initially, there wasn't sort of an agreement on how this could work, and came back again and said, well, how about if we make these arrangements? That process, I think, was very important to them, both on the congregation side for them to feel comfortable with this new arrangement, but also for the pastoral couple to feel like, yes, this will work for us, this will work for our family. Um, and they, and they at the point of the interview, were very happy with the arrangement. Um, and it was very structured, very careful in how they thought about how this would work for them. The husband uh, was a part-time worship pastor, but also a chaplain on a military base nearby. And uh, the wife was the lead pastor, and so had more sort of hours blocked out through the week of commitment to the congregation, but also served chaplaincy role at a local regional health center, but also was doing in-person palliative care among a rural area where they would actually go and visit the person in their home who is under palliative care with the local regional health authority, and also carried a role as chaplain through telehealth, right? So very unique combinations, but for them, they felt very positive about how this fit and they could map out their week and they could explain how that worked with family life and what time they then had free to work with their uh, their local congregation. It sounds like what I'm hearing from you is that pastors really need to negotiate the role with their congregation and how it's going to work. And at various times in other podcasts, I've mentioned that I'm a pastor's wife, and it seems like even for, for univocational pastors, they have no trouble filling their time with ministry obligations. And I think one of the things that really stuck out from the reports and from your most recent book, it was Wanda Malcolm's chapter that said there were really no differences in levels of satisfaction or stress between multivocational pastors and univocational pastors. What do you think is contributing to this? Is it this ability to be very intentional to negotiate the terms of two forms of employment as a pastor with their congregation? Is it expectations? I think if Dr. Wanda Malcolm was in this call, she would probably say, we need more research. <laughs> you know, from a researcher's perspective, we don't want to overstate or go beyond what it is we were able to gather in this particular project. But we did have significant conversation about the issue of calling. So what clarity do people have about their calling? How do they understand what God has asked them to do? And what is the significance of that for them? In the interviews specifically, there were people who stated, when you're facing multiple pressures from multiple directions, it's the calling that actually keeps you focused and brings you back to why you're doing what you're doing. There's another individual who just talking about the general workload said, yeah, well, it's calling, right? You, you know what God has asked you to do, why God has asked you to do this. And so you're, you're willing to press through, you're finding a way uh, to work out the complications. So there is something there that really 
would be valuable to be explored further of the uh, the meaning that people place in their work and why they do their work. But that is one factor that I know that uh, Dr. Wanda Malcolm and her team found was significant in their research about clergy wellness was the role of calling. I do think we should return for a moment to your question about negotiating or your comment about negotiating, because I do think that's a significant insight. So it was very common among the interviewees to hear them talk about team (laughs) and how in their congregation they needed to function as a team. And some were very explicit, you know, almost blunt about what this meant. They said, they all know I have another job. And so people need to pick up other pieces or else this isn't going to work. Some of the ones who went into more detail talked about both how they worked at having people pick up the right pieces, right? So the one comment was along the lines of, I only have so much time to give to the congregational leadership, so I should be making my best offering there. I should be playing to my strengths. I should offer what I'm gifted to do. And then others need to do the other parts, right? And uh, they said it much more eloquently than that. Um, I believe there's a quote in the report. But it was partially that discernment of gifting and passion and what people have to make as their best offering in congregational leadership. And partly it tied into theology of their ecclesiology, their understanding of the body of Christ that, you know, these pieces are supposed to fit together, but we have to find a way to make the pieces fit together well. James, is there a kind of congregation where this uh, team or collegial model works better than, say, a pastor, solo pastor-led model? I'm thinking you mentioned earlier about the Plymouth Brethren and their tradition and how tent making or multivocational ministry has always kind of been a part of their DNA, if you will. But the Plymouth Brethren, right from the beginning, have always had a sense of being kind of lay elder led. They've never really had that full time uh, vocational pastor. And to some extent, you could say that the Plymouth Brethren have actually created a model that this fits in. Now that you have a team that you're consciously making in the church, what are kind of the conditions that have to be there in a local church setting for that to succeed? Because I would think that there'd be situations where that wouldn't succeed very well. It really varied in our examples. So everything from an incarnational ministry, I believe that's the language they used, which sounded very much like it was sort of a network of house churches, to a Christian community of faith that decided that they should be expressing their faith on different days of the week and so didn't have a set Sunday service. So it was very innovative. They talked more about rhythms rather than sort of a weekly schedule. To a congregation that had been established, I believe it was for over 50 years, where they'd never had paid staff. And so it was sort of, it wasn't Plymouth Brethren, but it was sort of operating in that way that you've described, Rick, where there's an expectation that everyone's making a commitment to the congregation functioning. To a large multi-staff church where the youth pastor is both youth pastor and also works in the educational system of the city and, you know, stated very clearly, you know, I can work part-time in my assisting role in education, because my position is in a great deal of demand. And so I can sort of set my own hours and location and make it work with what I'm doing in congregational ministry. And so I think we had examples really across the spectrum of different sizes and styles of congregations. And it probably comes back to what Lindsay was saying about the negotiation process. At some point, someone had that conversation about, well, we could make this work, right? Or we should do it for this reason. So, James, we've talked about multivocational ministry from the perspective of the denomination and even from the perspective of congregations. What about seminaries and training institutions? Are there ways that they can better prepare pastors for a multivocational ministry or serve pastors in these roles? How, how do we approach this from a training perspective? 
Dr. Mark Chapman, who is one of the uh, co-researchers in the project and is the director of the Doctor of Ministry program at Tyndale University, he and I hosted a extended webinar and invited theological educators to come and join us and talk about what does it mean to train multivocational leaders. We had two examples at the time that we felt were very different examples of giving expression to that. We asked Dr. Tim Tang, who's the director of the Tyndale Intercultural Ministry Center, to present. And they've had a long-standing training program offered at the certificate level. So below, you know, it's, it's compatible with their bachelor's degree, but it's, a, it's sort of a set apart from their bachelor's degree where they're offering very low-cost tuition. Um, they organize on weekends. And it's been largely in demand with recent immigrant congregations, and I use recent loosely, right? Some congregations have been well-established in Canada, but they're, they're looking for ministry training that's very accessible. And there they've managed to work that out, where you're getting people at different layers of the congregation trained, but on a, on a weekend with, you know, a series of Saturdays in sort of a workshop format with an instructor who's very interactive. We also asked Major Andrew Morgan, who was the principal of the College for Officer Training for the Salvation Army in Winnipeg, and they explained how they do sort of an integrated process with their two-year cohort program at the undergraduate level, and really are preparing people to both be pastors, so you have courses on preaching and pastoral care, but also you could be the director of a social service agency or you could be managing a thrift store. So you're learning business practices. You're learning what the expectations are to operate within the social service sector. So those are two very different examples, but they're providing access to people for ministry training where they could have other work that they're doing alongside. More recently, New Leaf Network and Briarcrest have uh, partnered and received a, a grant to focus on what it looks like to provide multivocational training for people entering into ministry. And so there's a whole sort of program developing there. Dr. Jay Mocheco at the uh, Leadership Center is guiding that. And they're doing some experimentation around here are the components we think could be most beneficial for someone who's entering into multivocational ministry and taking a very holistic approach, as many seminaries are these days, right, in terms of not looking just at the education, but also the wellness of the individual. So James, you have just put out a book called Tent Making, of which I believe you're one of the editors and a contributor. So congratulations. Thank you. As people read this book and learn about your research, what do you hope that the takeaway is and what kind of impact would you like to see in the local church? It's a really interesting collaborative book. I'm very thankful to uh, Dr. Uh, Neri Santos, who is the co-editor and is also a tent maker. <laughs> he uh, serves as a pastor for a series of churches, as well as uh, being a professor at Tyndale. And the other collaborators also brought very helpful perspectives in terms of some of them were co-researchers on the book. And so we drew from the research material, but some of them were practitioners who were aware of what we were doing, were informed of the research, but just shared out of their own experience. So this book both gives you access to the researchers doing the, the broad sort of summary findings from the research, but also gives you direct access to practitioners who are reflecting on what has made this significant for them in serving in a Canadian context. The other component, Dr. Neri Santos has a PhD in New Testament, and so he added a, a biblical framework. And Dr. James Pedler added a theological framework. And I think probably that theological chapter captures the overall intent of the book in that this can be normal. <laughs> this idea that God's mission, the Missio Dei, permeates all of our life, that the Spirit of God is at work all around us, and we can operate in that understanding of our reality. So ministry isn't something that happens in the four walls of a church building or only with a select group of people who've gathered and recognize, you know, Jesus is Lord. But it's actually 
a mode of being that we can carry through all of our week. And there's a few of the authors who emphasize that as actually being part of their rationale for why their congregation operates with paying people part-time. It's, it's not that they're just, uh, they're just cheap or they're trying to get a good deal. It's that they actually want their leadership to be fully integrated into other areas of life in the community because that's their understanding for everyone in the congregation. You, you don't stop being a Christian when you go to your workplace. So how do we have sort of an integrated approach to what it means to be people of faith in all the areas of life that we encounter through the week? Rick, what were your thoughts about what James had to say? You know, whenever we have one of these discussions, I'm, I'm always interested in um, why now? Why are we talking about multivocational ministry now? And, and you know, I, I take James's point that it's always been there, but I think that the discussion is, is really new and rich. You know, James was talking about one of his hopes for the research was that we've sort of normalized multivocational ministry as a, as a type. And I remember, you know, when I was at seminary at Tyndale, Victor Shepherd, one of the professors there, used to say that every church takes on the forms of the secular government at the time that it was created. So he would talk, you know, about how you get uh, more of an empirical magisterial form for, say, the Roman Catholic Church or democratic forms for Baptists. And I wonder, as we sort of slip into a different time culturally, I think even civilizationally, where we have lives where the diversity of our lives is sort of linked to the authenticity of our lives, whether it is now more acceptable in a church life to have kind of a life that is built from pieces and put together still kind of within an understanding of calling, but... I think that there's something to our cultural moment that makes this form of church acceptable in a way that it wasn't acceptable, say, even 20 or 30 years ago. I think 20 or 30 years ago, you would have, if you had talked about proposing the idea of multivocational ministry, most of your peers would have said, is that because you can't be successful enough to have a full-time pastoral job? I'm even thinking... As much as I agree and want to affirm that multivocational ministry should emerge as a legitimate type of pastoral work, I also have a similar hope that congregations would be convicted to give, that they should be convicted that supporting a pastor in full-time ministry is something good and honorable and also exemplified in Scripture. I would love to see these dual outcomes affirmed and celebrated, and I think it's going to take a lot of intentional teaching on the part of congregations. But I do understand, you know, it, it is hard to really live and support a family in the inner city of, of certain cities. I'm thinking Vancouver and Toronto with some of the skyrocketing house prices, even with inflation, to really support several pastors or one pastor to live and flourish in a community like that, I could understand there really being a need for supplementary income. As James said, if that income can also align with other goals and gifts of the pastor, it seems to really make a difference for their well-being. So being able to have the framework to assess the needs of a pastor and their family are some good things that should be looked at and considered. Yeah, Lindsay, I think you make a good point uh, talking about how there's different types or models of church depending on the situations that people are in. And, you know, some of that is dictated by theology. You know, James was talking about Plymouth Brethren, and in many respects, it's their theology about the priesthood of all believers that sort of lead them to a place where they, they don't have a full-time pastor. And I think it's only in recent years that you're starting to see Plymouth Brethren churches have pastoral staff at all. And so there's going to be very different types of churches and configurations. Some are still going to have a full-time staff, multiple staff even, because that's just what the ministry that, that they've established demands. 
One of the things that James talked about as well that you know really kind of almost haunts me is this idea that a pastor will do his ministry or her ministry better if she is out in the workforce sort of rubbing shoulders with real people. And there's just kind of the, behind that is the idea that if pastors weren't out in a sort of a non-ministry setting, that they'd almost be cloistered away uh, mm -hmm. in not touching base with people. And, you know, to, to some extent, there's some truth to that. But I wonder, again, I always think about what has changed in our society, because I think that there was a time when pastor was a respected sort of integrated part of communities. And I think that there's some social distance now in our culture between, well, especially evangelicals and, and the rest of the culture that leads us to the place where we conclude that if we are not sort of leaving the context of vocational ministry and deliberately situating ourselves in these other contexts that maybe we won't come into contact with non-Christians. You know, to that point, while I was preparing, doing some of the literature review for our small church project, I was reading some stats about how pastors are now actually perceived alongside lawyers and politicians. There's really a sense of distrust and so I, I wonder if this is a response to that, to, to building bridges, I, I think James used that term, and of maybe changing the face of what it means to be a pastor because people have actually rubbed shoulders with one outside of the context of a church that they might never set foot in. But I'm trying to think of, does it always have to be? I, I do think that pastoral work is legitimate work whether it's part-time or full-time. And so I want to be able to honor the work of the minister without having to separate it from the legitimacy of the work of somebody in finance or in hospitality or who, somebody who's a farmer. And so often it seems like we respect the skill and the expertise of other professional work but there's something about pastoral ministry where I think a lot of people think that I'll consult my pastor, but I have the final say. And I would love to see the expertise and, and the wisdom that a pastor has cultivated be restored to a, a place of respect and understanding. Thank you, Lindsay. Those are some good thoughts for us all to think about. Thanks for listening. Find out more about the EFC's research at www.theefc.ca slash research.